to recap a few accomplishments for our district that I've had the opportunity uh, to push for and be involved in in my short tenure so far. We are coming up on one year. It's, right. it's flying by. Um, so this isn't everything, but uh, the five things I want to share with you that we can be proud about uh, in our district. I'm sure there's plenty to be proud about in District 6 as well, uh, but focusing on District 2, I um, want to start with item one, Multifamily apartments. I know we're tired of them, and I want to let you guys know that I have successfully deterred, whenever possible, multifamily from being built on land that is not already zoned for it. Sometimes these developers want to take meetings with the council person in that district, and they want to gauge your temperature before they spend a bunch of money applying with the city for zoning changes, before they spend a bunch of money on site plans. And at that time, I firmly let them know, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the mayor has had my back on that, and we have tag team even the last few weeks to deter uh, some multifamily developments that they didn't even apply. After our meeting, they just said, we're just going to, I guess, go to another city. So that's what we want to let people know. Don't come asking for that if it's not already zoned for that. Um, <laughs> So item two, multifamily related as well. Um, when we are zoned multifamily, we can't do anything about it. I have numerous times at this point had the opportunity to meet with different HOAs, to meet with different developers, to advocate and negotiate for you guys on what they can do differently to make it more palatable for the homeowners. Um, sometimes what that looks like is adding beefed up landscaping, requesting enhanced security checks of their uh, tenants, maybe a dog park, uh, requesting that they reorient how their developments are uh, set up. So for instance, maybe put the tallest building in the back and the shortest building in the front so that uh, they're not looking into your backyard. So these are the type of things they don't necessarily have to do. Um, so that's why it's important that I take the time to meet with them and negotiate. Um, one of the developers told me that I uh, kept telling them to sharpen their pencil, as in, what else can you shave off that we don't want to see? Um, and that has even resulted in fewer units. So uh, zoning will allow for a certain number of units, um, and they can max that out by right. But after negotiating with them, I've been able to have them to decrease the number of units. So these are the kind of things I'm fighting for for you guys, even when we may be stuck with multifamily in that particular scenario. Um, item three, one of my passion projects, um, retail and economic development in our city. I've got emails, uh, people have stopped me to ask about where are upscale restaurants? Mm -hmm. Are we going to get something outside of Epic Central, which we're obviously very proud of, but we have more land that we can put exciting retail on, not only in District 2, but throughout the city. Um, so a lot of people don't realize what it takes to bring those things to our city. It's not just, you know, just build the building and they will come. There are a lot of metrics these corporations look at regarding whether they want to build a restaurant in your city number of rooftops in the radius, uh, mean salaries in the city. Um, we're a long, thin city. We're not a big, wide city. So all of these things make it a little challenging. Um, but I have completed a course on um, retail economic development for municipalities. I've been working with our great economic development department just to educate myself so I can get involved in better strategizing how to bring these exciting places and businesses to our city so that we don't have to always drive to Arlington and mm -hmm. Dallas, which um, obviously Epic Central is fantastic. So please go there, spend money there, enjoy there. Uh, but we are working on expanding that to other areas of the district and city. 
Um, two more quick points. Uh, myself with Council Member Johnson and a few other council members just came back from Washington, D.C., where we met with two congressmen and one congresswoman with request for Grand Prairie. Um, for District 2 in particular, we have requested $10 million for what is called the International Corridor. It's a five mile stretch down on Pioneer Parkway. Uh, and basically, that intersects where the new Sprouts is. So I envision that Sprouts kind of represents to me a revitalizing, the beginning of a revitalizing that area. There's a lot of old strip malls. With this money, they would expand walkability, really improve landscaping, try to improve the facades on these old strip malls and make it a revitalized uh, place for shopping and community engagement. So we are waiting to hear back from that, but that is specifically uh, in District 2. So that's relevant. And I'm glad Sprouts is here. I think that's gonna be the beginning of something really exciting uh, for our district. Uh, lastly, uh, Council Member Lopez and I are working on bringing Epic Central's first art and music festival. So very excited about that. We're working on the website now. Uh, we will be launching this month applications for vendors, whether you're an artist or you know an artist, or maybe you sell candles or soaps or something. Um, we invite you to apply to be a vendor. The city uh, with a small fee will be providing uh, with a 10 by 10 tent. So you won't, you won't be standing out in the sun. And it's just gonna be an exciting time to shop small business check out unique art, hear great music, meet your neighbors, um, and that will be this fall. So stay tuned. The official date is not determined, but we are gonna go ahead and open the portal for uh, applications for vendors. So we're not quite certain how long it'll take to fill everything for the scope of what we want. But we want it to be grand, we want it to be epic. Uh, so look out for the art and music festival at Epic Central. Uh, with that, like I said, I'm coming up on one year. Uh, it's not quite here yet, but I'm keeping busy. Um, please do email me if you have any ideas. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Councilman Johnson to share about District 6. Thank you. Thank you everyone. I have to see how we can start on that end, but that's okay. <laughs> Okay. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, how many people here from District 6? All right, that's what I'm talking about. How many from 75054 area code? Great. We're trying to get you from just across that bridge to come up to the city because there's a lot we have to offer. Uh, I've been to City Council, uh, District 2. Some of you guys were uh, instrumental in getting me elected. I appreciate you guys still coming out to support the city and more importantly, support uh, Jackman as a, a new city council member. We have a lot going on in District 6. We got, uh, the staff is going to discuss a lot of it, but right now uh, I'd like to talk about Main Street Fest. Main Street Fest is coming up next weekend. I invite you all to come out. Go to the website, which I don't have it in front of me. You will see that we have a, a different format this year. We mixed the genres of music up instead of having one day, all one genre and another day because we decided to try to make it more inclusive to have everybody come down to enjoy a free festival, a free concert. So I look forward to seeing everyone down there. I don't know if you knew about it or if you looked at the, uh, the web page, but I did put it on next door and I got a lot of positive feedback uh, response in regards to Main Street Fest this year. Um, the only thing I really want to talk about is we're going to build a community center later. We're going to uh, we're going to discuss this now with the staff to build a community center on the corner of Lake Ridge Parkway and England Parkway. We understand that some people may not want that because they have some, some concerns. And that's why before we actually finish everything, we're going to come out to the community and have folks talk to you. What do you want? What do you don't want? What are your concerns? So when we build this, because I believe good, uh, city government is forced to take care of the safety and the quality of life of our citizens. And if you look at anything south of the first bridge, there's nothing there. We have in which 
Miralagos and, and the Peninsula Clubhouses, I've reached out to them to see if we can have a warming and cooling station for everybody if they participated in a uh, mobile uh, powering station. They felt that they wanted to keep it separate. So I started looking at what could we do to ensure all the, the, all the majority of the citizens down there, in case the power goes out, which you know it does, uh, the gas go up, can't get your home, to ensure we have a heating and cooling station as well. Uh, right now, up here, I live close to Bay Warmack Library. If the power or the gas goes out, I can come here as a heating for a heating cooling station. But what about everyone south of the bridge? Uh, it's not that easy. In particular, when it freezes up, how are you going to get across? And I've talked to some citizens about that. They believe that it's the individual homeowner's responsibility to navigate around take care of that, but I believe it's also our responsibility responsibility as uh, leadership, as leaders of the community to ensure you have somewhere to go that's safe, that's warm, and it's cool depending on the, the climate or the weather, uh, temperature. So those are two things. Uh, oh, one last thing. When I was knocking on doors, you said you wanted a, the apartments, no more. <laughs> I'm the same way. I wasn't for it. Because unfortunately, I said at my last town hall, we have zoning that's for apartments, and we still haven't built. There's been zoning changes before I got on the council. My approach has been the same as Councilmember uh, Hedden. We're not supporting the zoning change. It's it's just a lot. I heard you. The second thing I heard from you was that we need a upscale grocery store. I got you a pick of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking, but we're working on that. We, we It's not as easy, just like bringing a restaurant. We're working on that. So hopefully we can get something within the next year to bring down uh, within District 6. And if so, you're, you're going to be the first one to hear it on next door. Uh, if you want to follow me, shameless plug. <laughs> I'm on there, uh, District 6, so you can follow me there because I post a lot of information there. Uh, last little bit of uh, business. We're going to hold all the questions until the end. So we're going to get through it, let everyone get through the presentations and hold the questions until the end. And there's going to be one question per person. So we want to give everyone an opportunity, opportunity to answer, uh, to, to ask a question. So with that, pitch right back to Councilman McKinney. I, I call. I give myself a applause. Um, you got something? Yes, yes, sir. Um, I like. I need to recognize Council Member uh, Mike Dabosky is here. Council Member Daniel Zaro. Also, Jill Cooper. Am I missing anyone? And don't forget, Councilman Kurt Johnson. So we're going to kick off our presentations with our mayor. Mayor Jensen is going to discuss homestead exemptions and property tax decreases. Very Ooh. exciting. Need to turn a little story about the apartments that. Jack was talking about one of them was so persistent. Oh my goodness. What can we do? This, that, and the other. They will enlarge the clubhouse. So finally, we talked and said, Jack, we just need to tell them no. And I'll be on the phone with you. So we got them on the phone, and well, Mayor and Council Member, what can we do? <laughs> To get you to approve it, and the answer was simple: build something that's already zoned for. If anything you bring to us, doesn't matter how pretty it is, it can have a nice restaurant out front, but it has MF in it, as in multifamily. <laughs> We're not going to approve it. Well, what if? Jack, when I remember them asked, what if we got the neighbors to buy in? We said, we repeat. <laughs> if it has multifamily in part of the zone, 
we're not part. And they finally said, we hear you loud and clear. And they went away. Uh, so uh, let's talk about homestead exemptions and tax decreases. The last two years, both years, we have done a two and a half percent homestead exemption and a half a penny property tax. Now, let's talk about what those mean to the homeowner. The half a penny cuts our taxes, our, our income by $1 million. The two and a half percent homestead cuts our income by the same amount, $1 million. So that two and a half percent and the one penny, those two years cut our income by $2 million. However, the two and a half percent homestead, that million dollars for the two and a half percent is only used spread across homeowners that have filed a homestead exemption. Not homeowners that are renting their house, not apartments, not retail. So it means four times as much to you as the half a penny does. It's like if we if we had to do the equivalent, we'd have to reduce everybody's taxes by two pennies to get the same equivalent for a homeowner as a two and a half percent homestead. So the last two years, we've done a two and a half percent and a half a penny. We're having it on the agenda here soon to increase the homestead again exemption again this year, another two and a half percent. So that will be seven and a half percent over the last three years. And that's like getting six pennies. So, you know, that's, that's a lot to help. So thank you all. Uh, we have a, a budget that our budget team works on real hard and our council is, we're gonna approve that really soon. So thank you all and thank you for coming tonight. Next, we're gonna have uh, a senior manager who does an outstanding job for all of us. Uh, without him and his staff, that we can't do anything because Mark, the largest cities, the city council have their own staff. We have to rely on our city staff to do an outstanding job as far as any things we need. Uh, I forgot the name already. The lady just came up to me and said, "Hey, thank you for helping me with this." I don't remember because I just get to working on it, and I have to send an email to the staff, and if the staff responds back to me, then I respond back to, to you guys giving you the answer, hopefully within one day. And she remember I, I responded within an hour, you know, and I get that a lot. When they call me or send me an email, uh, I wasn't expecting someone to call me this fast. Well, uh, that's what I'm here for. So, and then, you know, I'm here, I'm gonna be very responsive to, to your concerns. So let's welcome uh, City Manager Steve Dye to talk about the Lake Ridge Community Center. Thank you. Hope I can count some members. Uh, first of all, a big thanks to our staff that's here tonight. I always appreciate, appreciate you all being here and being so engaged and well prepared. Uh, hello to all of our citizens. I see a lot of familiar, friendly faces and good to see you all. Just real quick, I'll expand upon what Councilmember Johnson talked about, about the Lake Ridge Community Center. So as you all know, we're very long and narrow city and we're growing to the south. So it, it was time that we did something further south and council directed us to find a piece of property, which we did there at the corner of England and Lake Ridge. Uh, we're in the process of acquiring that property. The vision for the community center is not uh, your traditional rec center, a very modern concept. And here would be likely some of the elements, indoor and outdoor recreational opportunities, um, a library component and some meeting space. And as Council Member Johnson mentioned, if we need a, a cooling or warming station, it'll be equipped with generators. There's about nine acres on that flat. About seven are developable. The other two are in the floodplain with, with a lot of trees. So it's a very pretty piece of property. We are very, as you all know, a very transparent and open government. So likely, probably towards the end of the summer, many of you, if not all of you, will receive a survey Council and staff want your feedback. Then we will have some public meetings, at least one, likely more, to really garner that input. I want to temper expectations. We can't always build everything that everybody wants because we want to be good stewards of our taxpayer dollars. And we want to set a proper budget. But I can tell you it's going to be a very unique, innovative space, probably the first type of its kind in this area. I think it's going to be something that you all are very proud of. We're going to try to save couple of acres on the hard corner itself, 
for maybe some future development involving some type of food and beverage offering perhaps. So we're trying to go about this very smartly. Uh, I think it's a great project. We've had a lot of fun working with council members on it so far. It's exciting. And again, we'll continue to grow uh, real quickly. I mean, our ETJ goes all the way to Highway 67, folks. And we'll work with two big developers down there on about 7,000 acres combined between the two developers on two master plan communities that likely over time will be annexed into your city, into our city. So it's a very exciting times. Uh, the Lake Ridge Community Center, that's kind of the placeholder name. Very exciting project. Again, I appreciate Council's vision and support for this project. It'll be something that you all will be proud of. We expect no adverse impact with traffic, noise, crime issues, none of that. As you all know, you're sitting in one of the safest cities uh, in the country, and I'll let Chief talk about that. So uh, we'll be here after the meeting. If you have any other questions, please let us know, and thank you all for being here tonight. Appreciate it. All right, let's go ahead and direct this to uh, the city manager's comment. Uh, Councilwoman Henning uh, had mentioned that we went to DC. We spoke to uh, Congress representatives. Congresswoman Clockett, she has to have a priority list of 15 items to put on there. And she put one of the city's agenda items. We requested $22 million for Lake Ridge Parkway to expand it with and including the bridge, an additional lane, bike lane. She put on there uh, around $2 million for us to get. So I feel like, okay, sounds good. We are at least on the top uh, 15 and we received the uh, $10 million. We got one of the bridges done. So next year we'll be back up there asking for the other $10 million to do the other bridge so that we can, that's why we know we're going to receive funding to ensure the traffic impact is not there by expanding to three lanes. And you should, you should be able to walk across the bridge. Now for me, I wanna be able to walk across the bridge, ride my bike and have a little fishing thing like in Florida, get a little <laughs> fish, you out in the middle of the lake. Everybody wants to fish out there if you don't have a boat. So that's what I like to see. Just wanna add that to it. Back to council on here. <laughs> Um, so next we have Chief Fight uh, discussing fire, medical, and emergency management. Very important for our safety. So we want all the updates we can get on that. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Fight, been your fire chief going on 11 years, believe it or not. Uh, just going to cover some of the things that your fire department does. Obviously, we fight fire. And we put a lot of effort and time in preventing fires. Daniel and I have an interesting business concept. We fight crime, we fight fire, but we put a lot of money to prevent the very things we're here to do, which is prevent crime and prevent fire. So we do have an interesting uh, model. We also provide EMS. Not every fire department provides the ambulance service. You take Arlington next door, 400,000 people, they don't provide the ambulance service. It's done through a private third-party contract. I will tell you, your EMS system here is far number one compared to anybody in the state of Texas. We win the American Heart Gold Award many times. We have 240 paramedics on staff out of our 250 staff. So essentially, no matter who knocks at your door, big red fire engine, big red fire truck, or an ambulance, you will have a paramedic at your door in four minutes, no matter what. And you've got to be proud of that. And our city council supports it, city manager supports it, and it, it is a great concept we have. We also run emergency management under the fire department. So emergency management is a unique business that uh, we prepare for the worst. We hope for the best. Well, you, emergency management does all the outdoor warning sirens. And I want to remind the group, because when we have storms, we get around 30 complaints on emails I was inside and I didn't hear the siren. And if you remember what I just said, it's an outdoor warning siren. <laughs> so a lot of people don't know that outdoor siren is only to warn you if you're outside in a park on the lake. Basically, it tells you to go inside. So it is not made to even alert you inside. In fact, many modern cities that are small in nature that are growing, take Melissa or an Anna up north, 
they're not even using outdoor warning signs because everybody has a phone. So that's really how you're being notified. So emergency management also does all of our grants, our reimbursement. We have a very complex fire department, but we're here to serve. We hope we satisfy you, and I'll be here to answer questions at the end. Can you, yeah. can you, I'm sorry, can you, since it's District 6, can you talk about Fire Station 11 real quick? Yeah, real quick. Fire Station 11 will be at the northeast corner of 287 and 360. Believe it or not, you have hundreds, if not thousands of homes that are in the city limits that far south. And we know we have potentially thousands more homes coming that will be in the city limits. So the mayor made a great point by cutting the tax rate by just a half a penny is around a million bucks. Doing the homestead exemption at two and a half percent is around a million bucks. Well, your fire station is going to cost around seven million to build. And then to staff it with 18 people around three shifts, 24 7, 365, or over two million just in human being cost. So it, it shows you how expensive, extraordinary expensive public safety can be that just a penny cut here and a penny cut there, just one fire station takes all that away. It's just an expensive business, but it's a necessary business. Thanks, Steve. Station 11, we're preparing for the build out down there and correct me because I'm sure I'm getting wrong, ISO 1. Yes, yes, sir. So the entire city is on ISO 1 rating, which is very hard to attain. You all have it. That means your homeowner's insurance, you're getting the best rates. Well, right now down there, those citizens moving in would not have a 1. So by building Fire Station 11, it will allow them to have an ISO 1 rating and get a better rate on their homeowner's insurance as well. Thank you. So that goes to show how forward-thinking your city staff is in the council. So we're looking forward to trying to stay ahead of the infrastructure. With that being said, uh, what we have next is Chief Sesame to talk about uh, things within the post department and outside. Thank you. <laughs> so whenever I go after the fire chief, I always have to have a retaliatory insult prepared. And he was nice, so I am always save it for another time. <laughs> Uh, so I want to quickly talk about crime. Um, really, really proud of the team here in Grand Prairie. So you, if you follow where we're at, you probably saw the FBI crime stats in 2022. Grand Prairie was the ninth, ninth safest uh, large city in Texas. 2020, thank you. Uh, pause because uh, 2023, we're now the eighth safest. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, we are an evidence-based uh, policing organization. We look at crime data and we allocate our resources toward those um, those locations. If you're ever uh, bored or need uh, some reason to sleep, come get with me and I'll unpack our strategy for you. But I, I will tell you that um, to kind of put it in perspective on why crime fighting strategies matter, if you look at this list, our, our northern border in Irving, they're sitting at number 20. Uh, Arlington is 21, Dallas is 29, Northwest Fort Worth uh, is our Northwest Fort Worth, they're 22. So quite a significant disparity in their uh, scorecard versus ours. Now, all those teams are going to probably get the stream and kick me in lunch. But uh, I'm really proud of the team because you have a very, very tenacious group of crime fighters that work in Grand Prairie. The other thing I want to talk about very briefly is uh, we don't just uh, focus solely on Grand Prairie. We look at crime problems that are impacting the entire state because they impact us all here in, in uh, Grand Prairie, and we go after those solutions legislatively. So uh, one of the things that we're very passionate about right now is getting rid of paper tags in Texas. We are seeing uh, violent criminals, organized retail thieves, human traffickers, drug traffickers, terror groups, all using fictitious paper tags to further their criminal enterprise. So I've spent a lot of time down in Austin trying to fight that, not to mention we lost Officer Brandon Sy in the line of duty while uh, pursuing a criminal that was had a fictitious paper tag. So that is uh, very, very high on our priority list. Uh, I think that's it. I was only given just a few minutes, and so I'll be around for any questions, but 
Uh, also, uh, I want to quickly say animal services and cruel compliance fall under the police department. And so I want to turn it over to Edward Cruz or Lily Yap, whoever's here, or Lily's here, to talk about animal services. And then I think Chad's going to come talk about short-term rentals, which um, I, I'm armed and prepared to protect him. <laughs> so, uh, but I will tell you, uh, as it relates to short-term rentals, I can promise you this. We are equally frustrated. And we're doing everything within our legal legal ramifications possible, including uh, pursuing the court remedies to uh, take care of that issue because it takes up a lot of our time. So Lily, would you come on up, please? Thank you. Animal control, all right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Lily Yap. I have... Uh... Okay, I have been uh, your animal services manager for just over four years now. Um, so I've been very happy to be with the city of Grand Prairie. We, uh, I wanted to touch on a couple of um, very important services that we provide um, to our citizens. So um, talking about um, when you see an animal out in the community. So um, for dogs in particular, um, we do have a leash law in the city of Grand Prairie. And so there are a couple of big reasons for this, because of course, dogs can be um, a public safety issue. So when you are seeing loose dogs, it is critical that you contact us. Um, even, um, you know, even on the side of data that Chief was talking about, um, the reports will help us identify the hotspot areas where we need to provide additional resources to. And then on the side of the pet owners, um, it's very important both, again, for people's safety and for the animal safety, that even if, you know, say you're just going to your car or you're just letting your dog out briefly, um, if that animal is in an unconfined space, there's a chance that if there is another animal that is maybe loose in the same fashion, there can be an animal on animal incident that can result in one of those animals being harmed. So it can escalate very quickly. And we wanna make sure that nobody, you know, whether animal or person is, is harmed in those situations. So um, we do also serve um, emergent calls outside of business hours. So um, there are lower priority calls that we focus on during the day, but we have officers available 24 seven to respond to aggressive dog calls, um, injured animal calls, calls of that nature. So please don't hesitate to call at any point. We have great folks um, in our communications department that um, route to our officer calls outside of those business hours. So just never hesitate to call us. Um, on the shelter side of operations, um, we actually adopt out um, hundreds of animals each year. So at any given time, we have up to 300 animals on site at the shelter. Um, so if you are interested in adopting, we have a great adoption package that includes spay or neuter, microchip, the shots up to date, um, and we get in new animals every single day. So we hope to see you, you know, both in the community and at Prairie Paws Adoption Center on Warrior Trail. I'll hand it over to Chad. Um, you know, like like uh, Chief Sesney said, you know we're we, we were fortunate that we were able to update the ordinance for the short term rentals. Uh, we really made it as stringent as we could without having to backpedal on anything. Uh, for those of you that have. You know, been to these before, uh, you've probably heard this, but I'm just gonna go through some of the changes that were made for those of you that, that don't know. Uh, the new ordinance requires that every short-term rental get an annual permit. It has to be renewed every year. Uh, there's a permit fee and an inspection that goes with that. So every year we can go in, we can make sure that they're not making any changes without a permit or doing anything that they shouldn't be doing. Um, it has an occupancy limit of one person for every 200 square feet and a maximum of 12. So we're, we're trying to cut down on the party houses and having too many people in there. Uh, it also prohibits street parking to kind of free up the streets and, and limit the amount of people, again, reduce the party house. It requires a neighborhood notice where they have to notify all neighbors within 200 feet of the short-term rental with a 24-hour contact 
for you to respond. You can you can contact them. You can contact PD if there's an issue, and uh, should get a pretty quick response. Uh, they're also required to inform the occupants of any city requirements, any codes, uh, when the trash can be put out, and any of our other laws that are there for everybody else. Just a kind of an update on each district. District six has 33 permitted properties. Um, it, we had 44 before the ordinance was passed. So we are seeing a reduction. We had 11 properties just say, oh, this is too much work. So they, they decided to either rent long-term or, or sell. Uh, District two has 34 permitted and we saw six leave after the after the ordinance change. So it is the, having the more stringent rules is making a difference. Um, we have about six or seven that are operating without a permit. Um, we're writing citations. Uh, um, every time I go to court, there's at least one or two short-term rentals on the docket. Uh, so we're out there. We have a short, we have a uh, code officer that's dedicated to short-term rentals. Um, we get a daily briefing from the police. Uh, if there's any call out to a short-term rental, then uh, we get that on the report. We go out and we investigate, and we issue tickets for anything that we can. Um, and you know, we're we're putting the pressure on them. We're doing what we can and you know if you have any issues i've got cards back there i've got a short-term rental fact sheet so grab a card feel free to call me and not just short-term rentals any any code issue just give me a call we'll address it oh two things real quick uh first of all we're lucky to have chad outstanding code manager the building is not on fire it was the heater <laughs> our team checked it out and cleared it for us so uh, and then the second thing i want to just add on this we staff and council are constantly watching the short term rental litigation. There's a lot of litigation. We are now at the most responsibly aggressive level that we can be without being litigated, but we're continuing to monitor. So you're going to see a lot of in, in the news about this in other cities. So as that clears the court system, then we can ratchet it up another level. But we're just being prudent and smart with our resources mm -hmm. and why so. That just because we're in a, in a pretty good place now doesn't mean that that's going to be the way it is long term. You know, our, our residents, our homeowners come first and council is very dedicated to that. So thank you. Thank you. Those presentations, um, I wanted to add regarding the short term rentals. One of the great things about this registration process is that uh, gotten notes from you guys that at times you want to contact someone regarding turn down the music, the trash has been sitting for days, and nobody, you know, knocking on the door, you really, th th that person doesn't own the property. So you really want to get to the person who owns the property. So this makes it such that these messages are given to the right person because these renters are coming and going. So you telling one person knocking on the door, you may get the next renter come and do the same thing. So that prevents that. Um, also for the presentation on animal control, Lily, thank you. I wanted to add, uh, you may be wondering who do I call if I see the stray animal. I inquired, I was told 911. Is that still accurate? That's correct. Okay, so 911, easy enough to remember. Um, I have had a few inst instances where I saw some pit bulls actually. So it's just 911. Um, <clears throat> lastly, um, Chief Sezzi, would, oops, would you mind to really quickly uh, speak on COPE? Just uh, explain how, how do they register and what it is? Thank you for that softball, madam. Yes, uh, COPE is a, uh, so one of the most dangerous encounters police have is with people that are in mental health crisis. So Grand Prairie is on the cutting edge of trying to get further upstream and avoid those uh, dangerous encounters by identifying those in our community that have, are suffering from mental illness. So what that looks like is if you have someone in your family or, or uh, uh, you have power of attorney over a loved one, we want you to come down to the police station and get them signed up for a COPE program. That will flag that individual's name, license plate number, and their address. So in the event that um, our police department is dispatched to an address or maybe a suspicious vehicle or they encounter a name, 
what happens is the officer will, will receive an alert and it will tell them who that person is, what their diagnosis is, and most importantly, it'll tell them what their triggers are. So maybe it's loud noise or bright lights. We will know that information in advance and we can reach out to loved ones to help us navigate that. It also, the program is designed so that in the event we have an encounter with somebody who's in mental health crisis, it's not in the program. We have uh, three licensed therapists on our staff that we partner with police officers. And what they'll do is they'll go follow back up with those individuals after they get out of treatment to make sure there's no barriers in their way to staying healthy. Sometimes it's just a dollars and cents problem. And so we can put them together with our Grand Prairie Police and Clergy Coalition to try to help offset the cost of their medicine and keep them healthy. So we're seeing people in our community that are having challenges reduced as a consequence of the, the COPE program. So uh, you just, you, you can't sign up your ex-Y for it. So <laughs> you, you, have, you have to have, uh, it either has to be you or you gotta have a license or legal authority to do so. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Um, next up, we have epic central updates and timelines from our creative producer, Zane King. Um, you've probably seen the construction. And you're probably wondering what else is coming. So he has all the information you want. Okay. Yeah. And Thank you all for being here this evening. I'm going to actually show you some pictures of what Epic Central uh, is. How many of you have been to Epic Central since we have taken down the gates? All right, so that means about half of you have not. Well, you are in for a special treat if you haven't been. And if you have, you're going to see even more uh, today. So, you know, one of the first things about Epic Central is it's 172 acres. So whenever we talk about Apex Central, you're going to see kind of the overview. So you've got all of the restaurants that you'll hear about later tonight. Like uh, you have the two hotels that are going in, you have chicken and pickle, you have Boulder, you have the Epic, you have the Summit. So all of these pieces make up Epic Central. Um, you know, we mentioned the restaurants and Marty's gonna talk about these in a little bit, but you have Loot 9, which is barbecue, the Finch, the Dora and Syrian Seats. Those are gonna be opening up this year. Then there's a new breakfast concept coming in. Uh, at the end of the year. And then we've got a few other surprises of our stage. Remember that uh, little playground piece, because you'll see that in a second. But remember also uh, the two hotels, uh, thousand person convention center. I tell you, this is one of the most impressive projects that I've seen in many, many years. It's been very intentional and the city is going to reap the benefits of this. It's really going to make the city of Grand Prairie something special. Um, you know, one of my favorite things is we talked about, uh, you know, we, we've done it right here. You have covered parking, we have monitored parking there. You can just see the intention that's gone behind every single detail. And that's kind of our tagline is we are epic in every detail. Of course, we have chicken and pickle, which if any of you have been there before, that has been one of the great success stories. We believe that's just going to continue on. Um, you know, the, the lighting in the water show, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit, uh, it really is second to none. And it's something that you can only experience here in Grand Prairie. But of course, you also have the Epic. You also have Epic Waters and the Summit and Boulder. And those are all part of what we're trying to provide to not only our citizens, because we want you to enjoy and be proud of your city, but we also want to attract those, those uh, dollars to be spent by those that do not live here. And we want to give them an experience that they say, I want to come back and I want to spend more money here. And then maybe they can even imagine themselves being a part of the Grand Prairie community because it really is altogether epic. Um, you know, this is kind of what we did over spring break and you can see the vibrancy, you can see the colors that we have. Uh, this little girl is one of my favorites right here because she was just cruising through. We normally don't have to hide it, but you know, we make an exception just for once. Remember, I told you about that playground? By far the most popular thing at Epic Central right now. Doesn't matter if it's day or night, this place is always packed and there are always kids, and there's places for mom and dad to sit around and to have a good time. The fountain's a great fun time. We have some interactive pieces that we built in. You can see the kids kind of playing around little one inch splash zone, just, just to have a little bit of fun with it. You know, Epic Central is great for date night. That's what we want. We want to encourage people to come out and have a good time. But parents, we also understand that sometimes you need a break too. And 
well, we let them have their little break as well. <laughs> but Epic Central is a really, really special place. And this is what really is people are excited about is they're starting to see the fountain. They're starting to see the water show. You know, I've been on board for a little over a year. And so I inherited a lot of this, but I can tell you that what your city council and what your leadership has done thus far is second to none. I've done this 15 years. I've never seen a project that is this amazing and this wonderful. It really is beautiful. It really is all inspiring. And this is what we're going for because we want everybody to be sitting there. We want them to capture those moments, but more importantly, we want to have those moments. I mentioned those restaurants real quick. The Finch is actually opening on Monday. They've been telling us May 1st, but you can go there on Monday and they will be open. Medora, we expect July, uh, July 1st and then Sirius Eats September the 1st. Um, just for special events, we have uh, 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 tomorrow, actually, we're doing a community party for the GPPD, celebrating the Motorcycle Rodeo, Read Across America, Flow of Blues at Christmas. Um, anything that you are looking for, you can find at epiccentral.com. If you want to know if there's a band, if you want to know when the show is going to, uh, we, have, we haven't announced the show yet, so it'll be launching this summer sometime, but that will be uh, on Epic Central, the schedule. If you want to apply to be a vendor, which Councilman Head will talk about in a little bit, uh, that is where you can find everything. But remember, I showed you those folks that were looking, uh, that they were trying to uh, take the video. This is what they were seeing that night. Wow. And so I'm going to give you just a 30 <laughs> but you see the idea of what we're going through. Yeah. And this is something that your city has done, and y'all should be very, very proud of it. And I'm lucky because I get to serve all of you by uh, leading the programming. But the main thing that I want you to know is that this the commitment that we have and what I've heard from your leadership and from my bosses, the city managers, is this is all about community. So we want everyone to feel welcome. We want you to have a place here and know that this is your place. And now you don't have to go to Grandscape. You don't have to go to Frisco. You can go right here to your own <laughs> crowd. So. Thank you, Zane. I just want to add for those who've been emailing me about the upscale dining, the Finch and Bedore are upscale. <laughs> so please go check them out. Um, and also want to follow up with Zane regarding people who want to be vendors and sell things. Does that application uh, put them in the running for all of these festivals? Every festival. Okay, so once you apply, you're in the running to participate in all the festivals uh, that we have. Uh, there are there is a fee for some of these, but you're in the running to basically participate in anything uh, that we're hosting. So if you sell something uh, or you make something, please sign up as a vendor. Thanks, Zane. I also like to add that uh, Blue Goose Cantina. Have you been there? Man, I think that place is awesome. And they got it right, patio. That's when the sun sets, it's on the other side. So you can sit out there on the patio. I can't wait to find some time to go out there. If I want to go with me, thank you. All right. Um, Peter Simes is our director for libraries, and he's going to come and talk about things at the library. Thank you, Peter. Good evening. The neighbors are going to complain how loud I am. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I especially want to count, thank Council Member Johnson and Council Member Hedden for having the event here. We love having you all come out. Um, I am the library director. I just became the library director last May. So I just want to kind of introduce myself to you. I am your library director. I worked for the library for 24 years. Um, I'm very lucky to have this position. We are here to work with you. One of the things we take great pride in is our service to each of our customers. We promise you, you come in here, we're gonna treat you with dignity, care, and respect, and we're gonna take time with you when you need it, which separates us from all the other libraries in this area. I have a passionate, caring staff that loves helping people. So please let us do that for you. Now I've got 
some programs I want to mention to you from the library. Yeah, boy. I'm sorry to say I do not have a, uh, I don't have a water show, <laughs> but I am going to use that at some point. Uh, how many people use audiobooks, listen to audiobooks? Fantastic. So what I want you to think about is making sure you have a library card because we have two programs that you can use to get audiobooks. And here's the key phrase for free. Okay, you can oh, download both these apps, and when you have a library card and PIN, you can get e audiobooks through Hoopla and e audiobooks through Overdrive. They also have ebooks, but I know the e audiobooks is a big thing right now. Library cards are free. You can get them in person here, or you can get them online, which means you never have to leave your home. We'll send you a barcode and a PIN, and you can start using these right away. One of the big things we're excited about is. We have partnered with our friends at the Irving Public Libraries on something called the Big Read, which is a community read event. This is one book, and this year, the book selected was Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. We have two big events that we're doing here in the city. One with thanks to Dwayne, our parks department, and the Uptown Theater, and our friends at Asia Times Square. We're going to have an art, Asian Arts and Film Festival. This will be during Main Street Fest next Saturday. We'll have two movies and then there will be a lion dance also performed. Mm -hmm. This week we'll release a full like detailed schedule of what shows when. So when you're down having fun at Main Street Fest, take a break and come on in and see the lion <laughs> dance or see one of the movies. And follow up with Zane because I'm not afraid to work on somebody else's stage. <laughs> we will have some water. Um, we have a book giveaway. One thing I wanted to mention about the Big Read is we will have free copies of the book to give out at both of these events. And there's also going to be a dragon dance performance. And this will be at the outside stage area at Epic Central. And again, we're super excited about this. Huge thanks to Zane for helping us pull that off. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody, I know it's April, that it's time for summer reading. And on Saturday, June 3rd is our big summer reading kickoff. That is at the main library, which is just a short jaunt up 161. It's a, one of our biggest days of the year. Please come out and join us, 10 a.m. to noon. You see what we'll face painters, we'll have characters to take pictures with, crafts, activities, and so much more. And just thank you for letting us serve you. And thank you for having us in your neighborhood. We're honored to work with each and every one of you. And that is it. Quick comment in regards to the uh, Lake Ridge Community Center where we sat to meet with you this afternoon. And, uh, Peter has been working with us on the library portion. He's come with this great idea that I really think is nice. The best way I can explain it is that when you go to a vending machine, you put money in and you get something out, right? Here, you're going to be able to use your library card and get a book. Now, if your book isn't there, from my understanding, you could request a book. And it'll be there in the vending machine the next day. So you just go down. So you wouldn't have to cross the bridge to come up here. I keep calling the bridge too far because it's, it's like it's too far for people to drive up here to see what's going on in the city. So I think it's a great idea. Uh, it's, it's not going to, we were doing the presentation. And I said, hey, where are the kids going to play at? He said, give me, some, give me some time. I got that figured out. Yeah. He does. I mean, it's a great concept. So we're working on trying to bring you a great product that you'll be proud of. And we want to get everyone in 75054 moving up, here, up to here because during the Christmas celebration, we had uh, what? The ice skating rink and we done some data. 75054 was not there. It's very small participation. So I need you guys to come up and see what we're doing in the city because we're doing all of this for you as well. So I need to pass back on over to Okay, we are cruising uh, through our announcements. We've got a few more for you. Um, next up, we have our parks director, Dwayne Strawn, who is going to discuss park updates, but also arts and recreation updates for April through June. Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne. Thank you all very much. And just to kind of tack on to what Peter said, what a great crowd. Uh, and it, it's good to see uh, engaged citizens. There's, you know, there's a lot of things that you could be doing tonight, but you want to be here and you want to hear what's going on in your community. 
Uh, my name is Dwayne Strawn. I'm the director for the Parks Department. Uh, it's a passion of mine. I've been doing it for, for 30 years, uh, three years as a director. So uh, this time of year is crazy in the parks world. It's spring and we're getting ready. So I want to go over a couple of things. Uh, Council Member uh, Johnson had mentioned something about uh, Main Street Fest. Main Street Fest is a three-day uh, event uh, downtown. Uh, it, it is MainStreetFest.com. It, it, it's, uh, it's on the, when you signed up, the QR code, it, it'll take you to that. But, but you can go to uh, MainStreetFest.com and see what all, but there's a huge carnival. There's three full days of music. Uh, there's food. There's arts and crafts. There's a kid's zone. It's just a place for everybody. And you can stay as long as you want. It's free. Uh, all the free music that you want. And uh, if you've ever had carnival food and fair food, that's the best food you can get. <laughs> lots of stuff there. So uh, check on that. But that is April 21, 22, and 23. Downtown Grand Prix. It's in the new, the new uh, parking lot of City Hall. So it's a great layout. And uh, you know the iconic uh, Ferris wheel is right on Main Street. So you got to come down and see us. Also on the QR code is our upcoming events. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot going on for our citizens. A couple of things I just want to, uh, to call out is every Saturday is Farmer's Market. If you've not been to Farmer's Market, you got to go down there. Bring your, bring your billfold because you cannot leave without a lot of really good stuff. Uh, so we had a grand opening uh, on April the 1st, uh, but it's a fantastic, great food, a lot of really great arts and crafts. I had uh, freeze-dried skills. If y'all not had freeze-dried skills, you got to have this. Uh, they're, they're amazing, but lots of good stuff. But also, we've got socking with the mayor. The mayor is very passionate about getting out with the, with the uh, with their citizens. And so uh, on, uh, on uh, Thursday, the 4th of April, um, Thursday, the, the 18th of May, and uh, the 16th, the 16th of so one more. Um, Thursday, the 22nd of June, we're all socking with the mayor. And we've had huge crowds that spreads out all over the city. And so, you know, please, please, please find, find some time to get out and go socking with the mayor. It's amazing. Uh, the other big things that we have going on is Cinco de Mayo is on, uh, on the 6th. Um, Memorial Day celebration at our veterans event, uh, uh, a veteran memorial park is on Monday the 29th. Uh, Grand Prairie loves and celebrates our, our veterans. Is there any veterans in here I'd like to, I'd like to uh, identify you? Uh, one thing I would like to ask our veterans is we have, we have a robust um, uh, Vietnam veterans group, but we're really trying to get the Desert Storm, that era, and, and, and it, it's a little hard. We're, so, if, if you know somebody we want, because the Vietnam veterans, they know that, that group is not going to be around. We've got to keep that group going so that our, our active veterans group is active uh, for, 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 uh, for here on out. So if you know somebody that is in that, that era, if you'll just have them call the Parks Department or give me a call, let me have their phone number, I'd be glad to reach out. But we really want to reach out to those groups because we've got to get that, that group started at our Veterans Event Center, because it's an amazing facility that's dedicated to our veterans. But I, I, I'd like a little help if we can do that. Uh, the next thing I'll talk about real quick is uh, the EPIC. If you, if you haven't been in the EPIC or you're not a member of the EPIC, I encourage you to at least go take a tour. Uh, there's some amazing things that happen. I'm going to hit some, real, some ones real quick. Uh, 120,000 square feet. It's a huge, a huge building that has a lot going on. Seven days a week. Uh, we're open on Sunday afternoons now. Uh, there's a mass array of offerings between the fitness, fine arts, and the entertainment. So it's not it's not your typical rec center. We include the fine arts and our entertainment in there. Uh, state of the state of the art fitness uh, facility. We have over a million and a half dollars of fitness equipment, uh, and you've got to see that. And at six in the morning, at six p.m. in the evening, it's full. You mm -hmm. can't get on. So the building kind of rests in the middle of the day. But it slammed, uh, it slammed their wheels. We got the elite free weights, our aquatics. We have a 25 yard lap pool, 12 person hot tub, and the vortex. And I heard Councilman Del Bosque talking about the vortex and how how that is on your, your water, uh, uh, your exercise in the water and, and the benefits. So take advantage of that. Also, the indoor uh, the adventure trail. 
uh, track. And it's a, it's a track. Most, most cities have a track that just goes one direction. Ours goes up and around. And so it, you, can, you can get a lot of things uh, that the normal one. Uh, our fine art is we have a professional chef and an artist on staff. We have a culinary kitchen uh, that was donated through Ikea. It's an amazing kitchen. We have an artist studio, and then we have an art gallery that our, our artist keeps full uh, of all the art. Uh, and then our, our for, the, uh, for the entertainment, we have a 200 uh, seat uh, theater, the Texas Trust Credit Union Theater, our recording studio, and then our rental spaces are amazing. Uh, everything from baby showers to the 50th anniversary is the Epic has a lot going on. So please, if you're not a member, uh, go by and see it uh, and become a member. A couple of really quick um, updates also is on uh, landscaping on Lake Ridge Parkway. We, we we're about to finish with phase one. We started at 20 and went south. There's a couple of beds that we're still working on. We're working on the design for that going south. So that's going to be continued. Thank you. That's going to be continued. So that that's coming. Uh, and then Lynn Creek Marina. You know, we we uh, the walkers. Uh, had the marina for years and years and years. They they've uh, they they've retired and they're enjoying their retirement. Suntex Marina bottom out, uh, and you've seen a lot of improvements, a lot of uh, curb appeal that they've done. Uh, they they've renamed currently re, uh, recently renamed the restaurant, uh, the Shack uh, was the Oasis. Now it's the Shack. Uh, they're working on their menu and they're working on their customer service and their pricing. So give them a chance. Go by go by and take advantage of, of a restaurant that closed. And then they continue to work on the renovations of their boat docks. Those boat docks are that they're original and they're starting at the back and they're working their way up. Uh, that's that is a, a huge project. There's a lot of boats, but they're they're trying to get all that put together so that it is the A plus facility that uh, that we know that it can be here in Grand Prairie. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you being here. I'll be around for questions. Dwayne, I actually have a follow-up for you. Dwayne? Yes. One more follow-up. So uh, when people join the Epic, uh, I remember during my initial tour, you mentioned, uh, or the, my tour guide mentioned, something like a parent's night out, if you mm -hmm. have a membership, isn't there a child care space on certain nights with activities? Are yeah, still as, doing yeah. That? no, no. As a member, there is a parent's night out, and and... All that is on their website, but we try to take care of our of our uh, members, and so you know we it's, it, we have stuff for the kids as well as stuff for the parents. So it, it's it's a one stop shop. You got to get by and see the Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, next up, this is another area that I'm very passionate about. I think we have a really broad council. All of our council members have different backgrounds and expertise okay. and passion areas. Um, mine is retail and economic development, small businesses, and art. So all of that uh, is broad, but under the economic development aspect of it, I mentioned that I have been participating in a course uh, to learn about municipal retail economic development. I've been working with our economic development team. I'm glad they decided to have me uh, as, as their assistant, if you will, uh, to try to bring different businesses here. Um, I'm also a supporter of small businesses. I'm a small business owner myself, and we have some exciting offerings for our small business owners in the city, um, or maybe you want to become a small business owner. There's a really robust program that has already launched. You can still participate in. If you know someone in Grand Prairie that has been talking about a business idea or getting started, tell them about it. Um, but right now, um, Hey here, Marty. Yes. Marty will, uh, he's our economic development director, speak on all of that. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a presentation too, so if you'll give me just a second, we'll get that pulled up and uh, be able to show you a little bit. We go. We're going to, uh, you heard Councilmember Hedden talk about Kay Brown Patrick. She had a conflict, could not be here tonight, but I'm going to show you her picture and invite you to something that she's going to do tomorrow. So that's one of the last things we'll talk about in our presentation tonight is these small business sessions 
through a whole new program through enterprise development. My name is Marty Weaver. I'm Director of Economic Development. I'll mark seven years serving you in late May. And it's been a privilege to get to work uh, with the city of Grand Prairie. Thrilled at some of the things we've got going on. What I want to be able to share uh, with you is a little bit about a couple of topics that they wanted me to visit with you about. In particular, make you aware of something that uh, the whole city is thrilled to see and that we're going to have and be home to uh, the very first cricket stadium in Major League Cricket that will also serve as the home to the USA men's and women's teams for cricket. Cricket is the second most popular sport in the world to soccer. And uh, yet it's not really ever taken hold, at least professionally, in the United States. And there was a process that came forward to compete. Uh, they came forward and chose, in particular, uh, to talk with Graham Cricket because they loved the Air Hog Stadium site and said, you know, we could convert that into a cricket stadium. Why don't we look into that? Uh, Major League Cricket has partnered with USA Cricket, and they're going to launch this league this summer. I'll show you in a second a little bit more about what's going to happen with six teams that have been formed from across the country. We'll be home to the Texas team and uh, they'll be, rather than using a, a Dallas name, they really wanna be known as the one for the whole state of Texas. It's in a T20 format. Why is that important? If you know what cricket is, when it's played in foreign countries, it can sometimes be a two and three day contest. The T20, thank goodness, the United States is only three hours. And so they knew that we couldn't handle something <laughs> as long as that. Uh, we're we already though, if you can imagine, you may have seen, there's a lot of people that play cricket, a lot of youth that play cricket in North Texas. There is a network called Willow. It's kind of like the ESPN of cricket. It's a 24 hour a day cricket channel. There's over 400,000 subscribers already in North Texas. So we anticipate there's gonna be a big following. Not only will USA men's and women's be based here, but it'll be their uh, corporate headquarters for USA cricket. They'll be adding a national high performance training center. They're going to be uh, competing, and we're already working with the governor's office in trying to get funds and help from the state to help us with policing and transportation for potentially to host some of the 2024 World Cup from the International Cricket Council. They've decided they're going to place some of those contests in the West Indies and some in the United States, and we'll have the largest stadium in the United States. So we anticipate we're gonna to get to host quite a few of those contests. That screen uh, that, that you showed with the with the water that, that you saw uh, earlier at Epic Central, we could foresee even showing some of those contests for fans that are coming in uh, at Epic Central to be able to see those cricket matches take place here in, as a part of the World Cup. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's a, it's a part of the, the franchise, there we go, for the state of Texas. This is when conversion began over at Airhawk Stadium, they've got great teammates in terms of the architects and the general contractors, people that have been involved in doing AT&T Stadium and Globe Life Field and other major stadiums, both here and across the country. Here's a few pictures of how they've begun to rework that whole thing and create the pitch in the middle to begin putting in seating. You're going to see it eventually look, this is the computer generated rendering of what they're shooting for. Uh, it'll accommodate in a permanent setting 7,500 to 9,000 seats, but you can add seats in the oval to take it up to 20,000 eventually. So that's why we're excited about international contest taking place here in Grand Prairie, Texas. This is uh, the owner and uh, Anurag Jain, one of the co-owners of the Texas franchise with a guy named Ross Perot Jr. You may have heard of him. Uh, they uh, were here touring with some of the, the players that they drafted just a few weeks ago. And that's where you see them in their hard hats taking a look. We're, we're really excited about that. Let's talk about some of the development that's taking place in our two districts. And uh, in particular, you've heard a couple of people mention this already, that uh, we, we're very excited. We do advertising leading up to the events that uh, Councilmember Hedden and I attend to uh, what used to be known as the International Council of Shop, Shopping Centers. It's now Innovating Commerce in Communities. Uh, we will go and talk about the good things. We began advertising when Ikea came six years ago that you needed to pay attention and come and get close and, and uh, maybe put your business close by. We were thrilled to make public at the end of this past year that not only Andretti's indoor karting, but Bass Pro are going to be locating right there at Forum and 161. Uh, this will give you an idea of the site plan where you can see the logo. 
right there for Andretti's. I'm going to show you a picture in a second where construction has already begun on that site. Uh, the, uh, the thing that says contract pending, this was made before Bass Pro was announced. And then we've got something else in the middle that I'm going to show you that's also become public. So I was out today just getting some latest, greatest pictures. Here's the entrance looking in where you can see some of that construction taking place. Sorry. Uh, so that's, we're excited about that right next to the highway. The site that I showed you here is going to be Big Shots Golf, uh, owned by the group uh, Club Corp of America uh, that uh, has been based in Dallas for years. They'll be getting under construction shortly as well at that location. And then right next to it, the first brewery in the city of Grand Prairie, Voodoo Brewery out of Pennsylvania, has already announced uh, they're under construction there. You can see right behind um, next to Billy Joe's Coffee and uh, the, the Jason's Deli, and they're going to be opening shortly. So as you move your way up the road there with towards Epic East on the highway heading north, you may have seen uh, the construction is continuing for our Hobby Lobby, as well as uh, some other things. There will be uh, a pop shelf within that too. They just put their sign up. And uh, then as well, if you go a little further next to the new coffee shop that's out in front of the courtyard by Marriott, site work is underway. Uh, the mayor announced it at State of the City that Crumble, uh, we're going to have Einstein Brothers Bagels and Payway all in this new development there in the hard corner of Pioneer. Zane showed you uh, Loop 9. Loop 9 opened up back in March. We were thrilled to see them. I was just there at a lunch meeting with a developer yesterday. And uh, to get to see the setting out on the water, uh, he was pretty fired up and, and saw that the Finch, we could see they were training their employees there on site. As you heard earlier, they're going to open up now on, mon on Monday, of all things. Um, you've heard from both of our council members tonight that there's a real desire to bring, bring quality restaurants to this city. We're thrilled to have offerings such as this and we're not finished. And then of course, just uh, as you continue on south of Epic Central on the west side of 161, construction is nearing completion for the residents in by Marriott there right next to uh, main event. If you go a little further in Epic West, you'll see we've gotten several new restaurants uh, in the last few months, uh, including uh, Jersey Mike's and just recently Cineholic. And then, of course, you, you heard Councilmember Johnson talk about uh, a great new addition. It's in Councilmember Hedden's district. Uh, the, the new Blue Goose Cantina. We're thrilled to see them open up. It is the largest Blue Goose by a thousand square feet they've ever built. And uh, I don't think they're finished. They love what they see here and they want to try to continue developing and investing in our community. And uh, if you go a little further south, there's not as much yet to talk about in District 6, but we're excited about some of the residential. You got to have the residential and the infrastructure to make development happen. There's some great uh, developments that are lining up nearby and are being marketed. And one that is in your district that you heard uh, Dwayne Strawn mention earlier, the shack is rebranded. It's upgrading its site. And certainly we're thrilled with that. Let me, let me close with what uh, you heard Councilmember Hedden mentioned earlier. This city really, our, our council and our management team wanted to make a commitment to bringing some of the same excitement you've seen on the President George Bush Turnpike Corridor to, if we can, residents throughout the community and as well to attack, and we didn't go into this, but to really help existing centers tucked into older parts of our city begin to redevelop. redevelop. We have a new program a retail redevelopment program that I'd be glad to tell you about if you're interested uh, to, to help bring that about. But in particular, we want to make it where others can come be a part of that same excitement. Many of the restaurants and retailers that are interested are telling us, have been for years, that they like to, they like to have a franchisee open up. So if that applies to you, maybe you want to get in on the action that's taking place on the President George Bush Turnpike. There's a program that Kay Brown Patrick, my business manager for retail attraction, for enterprise development and business retention has begun. And I'm going to show you a little bit about it in preview. Now, we, we had a video set, and unfortunately, it's not working. So I would encourage you to go to YouTube. This can You can watch this. Better yet, you can go to the chamber tomorrow. I'm going to show you in a second and hear Kay talk about it. But it's all set on this idea of sessions to help entrepreneurs get in position to grow. And uh, coming up in June, there'll be some additional sessions she's going to do on franchising, on the legal essentials of franchising, funding your franchise, and then a chat with others. 
And so this is K. Tomorrow morning, if you want to go here, go to the chamber offices at eight o'clock. Ironically, this all began, uh, this effort began uh, back just before COVID at one of these same chamber business uh, exchange events where people came up and talked about how can we get involved in what's taking place? We wanted to get started and introduce it. COVID hit, we kind of set it back. Now we're putting that information out and trying to help you either grow your business or create a new business and take part in the wealth that's being generated here in Grand Prairie, Texas. So I'll be glad to, to respond to any questions later when we're done. Just thrilled to get to serve you and work with a great team of policy leaders and, uh, and, and a management team and development directors here in the city of Grand Prairie. Thank you. I want to thank Marty, but I think he's sort of bashful about the grocery store Peter Wiggly that's coming down <laughs> somewhere in the city of Sioux, but <laughs> most of you guys, I guess, you are familiar with Peter Wiggly. I am. <laughs> yeah, most of you are going to say Peter Wiggly. Okay, we're going to have uh, our transportation director, Walter Schumack, and engineering director, Noreen Housefright up and talk about the Daymire Road construction and uh, kind of wisdom, kind of wisdom winding and other projects like that. So welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? I'm Marine Pouch, right? Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of projects I'm sure you're interested in. <laughs> Um, I know it's not on the list, but I'm sure you're all interested in the Deathman uh, roadway extension. Um, as you probably can see, the pavement and drainage are done. Um, they're, the contractor is on a hold right now because they're waiting for the pit wall to be built. They're, you know, they're not in conflict once that wall is built. They'll finish up all the sidewalks, retaining wall, landscaping and irrigation on that, and the roadway will be open. So that is coming soon. Um, on the Daymire Road, we have a couple sections. Uh, south of Raglan to Prairie Waters, the plans are at 90%, and the consultant on that section is working with the, one, the developer that is south of Prairie Waters to uh, finish that section. Um, and then the third section is actually being built by Mansfield, and Walter's going to talk about that. Thank you, Noreen. I am Walter Schumacher, Director of Transportation and Mobility. As Noreen said, we got a couple of different sections of Daymire. What she talked about is in the other section, which is primarily in the city of Mansfield. This is the one right by the high school going from Frawl slash English Street down to Seaton Road. That project is being made by Mansfield. The plans are primarily complete. They anticipate putting that out for construction later on this summer. It's going to go from the two, existing two lanes to a four lane uh, roadway. Uh, they anticipate about 18 month construction time. One of the things to note on that project, that street is fairly flat, so they're going to be doing a lot of drainage work in that same area, which is part of this project. Uh, going along a couple of other uh, highlights, as noted, um, good news, bad news type projects. I-20 frontage road, good news, they're finished. <laughs> bad news, they finished and created other problems. <laughs> We had, once the project was done, and anybody has been out there lately, when it rains, there are flooding situations. See, even this doesn't even like it. <laughs> there are flooding situations on I-20, specifically on the westbound lanes and also on eastbound entrance uh, coming from, from Carrier to get on the roadway. We have been in multiple meetings with Test out there, well aware of it. They had to do some redesign work, which is why it's taking a while. The redesign is primarily complete. They're still uh, putting the I's and the D and crossing their T's. And hopefully this will fix it. They anticipate this, this fits going out for, for B and probably later on this summer. Camp Wisdom Road. Camp Wisdom Road this is a joint project we have with Dallas County. Roadway is open. Good news. Other side of it. One of the issues with the old Camp Wisdom we had was people parking on the side because people love to go fishing, as our council member alluded to earlier. <laughs> <laughs> we still had the same situation uh, with, with the widening. So we're working with PD to help that situation to create a good, safe roadway. Because if you're on the south side, we have a nice, wide uh, hike and bike trail that we want the citizens to be able to enjoy and not have to go around parking cars in that same area. At the same time, we're working with the HOA contractor did do some uh, uh, 
bad things with the irrigation in that area. So we're working with them to get that fixed up. That's the good thing about what we do here in the city is we have a lot of joint projects because we get the biggest bang, biggest value for the, for the, for the dollar. Camp Whistle, 50 cent on the dollar. Same thing with, with our current project we're doing with Dallas County Wildlife Park way up to the north. Uh, that's one of the things we do very well here. And that's one of the things we have to stay on top of pretty good. Um, 161, a couple of different sections on State Highway 161 George Bush. Up north, there's some work around Egyptian Parkway. That work has been going on because there's a little bit of road separation on the frontage road. They've been doing a lot of background uh, fixing that people don't see, but there's been a lot going on in that area. The, the fix is just about done. We anticipate tying that up later on this summer also. The other side part of the you all see is what's going on on the front shore, right around Pioneer Park where Arkansas, where they've had to do a lot on the retaining walls there. In fact, one of the things that they were just doing earlier today was replacing a lot of panels there. They, they have committed to number one, when the panels are complete, they're gonna be aesthetic, not, not what's out there right now, which is pretty ugly to be quite frank. <laughs> um, they anticipate probably another eight months construction time to that, to that is done. So hopefully next time we come back, I can say good news, hopefully no bad news on this. <laughs> but uh, that's primarily NTTA, uh, Turnback Authority was doing that work in conjunction with test out. So that, that's going very well. A little bit down to, to what my group does with the quarter cent sales tax. So as we come into your neighborhoods to do some street repairs, sidewalks, that sort of thing. We have a whole list of, of streets and sidewalks we do. We really look at sidewalks on a case-by-case -case basis. But to give you an overall view for District 2, this fiscal year and the next fiscal year, we're going to be spending over $1.5 million. District 6, we're going to be spending closer to $2 million. And, and, and keep in mind, these are just on the repairs. This is not the CIP, our capital improvement program. That's when we get spending big money. That's what Noreen's mostly in charge. <laughs> so anyway, those are some very brief highlights because we got a lot of uh, construction going on and that's just the tip of an iceberg. And obviously we'll be around uh, when we get to the Q&A. Thank you all. I'd like to thank all the presenters for providing information that's going on for District 2 and 6. Like I said, this is a new format. We decided to try to join uh, together because District 2 is east of uh, Carrier and District 6 is west of Carrier. So we knew we were going to have some of the same people here. So let's go ahead and, and try to do a joint town hall. Plus, it takes from the staff not having to come out here two times. So we're being a little concerned about that. So now we're going to run to a rapid Q and A. Just joking. So, if anyone in the okay, anyone swing? Yes. How many do we have? We have about twenty people. Twenty. Okay. If you guys want to type in a question, we'll get to you as well. We have a question already waiting. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so there, this is for this too. Um, it is, I think Marty will be able to answer this. Somebody wants to know what the status for Rosa's Cafe is. Uh, great question. <laughs> and in fact, we reached out to uh, the, the folks uh, with the Bobby Cox company that owns that here just a few weeks ago. They are about to get their permits and anticipate getting under construction as soon as they receive. So, okay. Okay. That was easy. Where will Rosa's Cafe be? Where will Rosa, isn't that uh, by far? Mayfield. And yeah, Mayfield. Okay. Right there. If you, if you know where the uh, Rosa's is right next to where the gas well is, if, if you know where, uh, right there at Mayfield and 161, uh, across the road, Southwest same quarter. side. Southwest quarter. Thank you. Southwest okay. quarter. Okay. See you, Andrew. Southwest quarter. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go back to the ground rules. One question per person. So if you want to put a comma, whatever it means. <laughs> I'm not coming back to you. All right, you don't want any questions? Not here. Oh, never oh. Okay. Will the Lake Ridge Community Center affect our HOA? Yes. No. I didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I also need to recognize uh, John Stewart for being on the parks for about eight, 12 years, nine, nine years. And he helped out on the Main Street Fest this year. 
uh, as part of the committee, and we work hard. He worked so hard that we didn't give him a ticket to the show. <laughs> Yeah, next question. On a cheerful note, I read an article a couple days ago about Texas cities getting ready for the eclipse. I know it's a year out, but this is our last town hall. So, any fun plans? Uh, please enlighten us on the eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> we are in the path to totality for the um, April 2024 20, eclipse. Um, the Dallas is the best place to see it in the country. Yep. So I just said I just saw an article a few days ago that Texas City is getting ready for the eclipse. Just wondered if we wanted to do something fun. Believe it or not, the Fire Chiefs Association of Dallas County are already planning on it. <laughs> We're talking about up to five million visitors coming into our area for two minutes. <laughs> for, two minutes for two minutes, like 10 o'clock in the morning, we will be in darkness. So there will be a lot of partying. But public safety, it's going to be a nightmare. In the morning. Uh, yeah, in the morning, a couple minutes, it's called the Path of Totality, I think. Totally clips. You'll never see it again in any of our lifetime. Get ready for the party because it's going to be crazy. Stay after the practice, right? Yes, sir. I'm Clyde Bird. Here are, are you homeowners here in Grand Prairie? We're actually in your district, District 2, um, off of Carrier and Crossland. My question to you is that there is a um, a noise nuisance in our neighborhood of one of a Mickey's Bar and Grill that's been causing us a lot of anguish and pain. Um, and I'm also here with our other neighbors. Um, just excuse me for our, like, my voice, but I'm very passionate about this. And we just want to know like, what's the difference between having a bar and having a nightclub? That's in our neighborhood. It's, it's it's something that we and we could table and talk to you maybe a little bit further. This is a one-on-one discussion as well. But um, we just like let's put this on the table. Let the city council know that this has been an ongoing issue with our neighborhood on Hope Meadow Drive. For many years. Thank you for and mentioning you. that. Yeah, that uh, establishment is so close to residential. So I'm going to pass it over to our chief to give some. I have a backyard full of glass beer bottles, Tennessee bottles. Uh, every I can't even talk about it, it makes me so we, mad. We also have three o'clock in the morning. I'm still listening to my windows. Man, you don't have yeah. to convince us. I, I, know, honestly, I, I, I hear this, I hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah, but as you know, we are familiar with the issue. We are running out of citations in our ticket books that we've given to Mickey's. Our code compliance team is 100% on top of that, and uh, we we have spending a lot of time over there. Uh, we are exploring um, new methods in which we can uh, apply a little more um, incentives to gain compliance because what we don't want is citation to become a regular cost of doing business for a, a business owner. So um, we spent a lot of time over there. We are well aware that it's an issue and we'll continue to stay on it. What about the TABC? Can they not do anything about them sitting in the parking lot drinking Ma'am, I'd be glad to answer your question so long as the councilman doesn't beat me up for two per customer. Okay. Uh, the, the, the answer is yes, they can. So can we and do. So the question was, what can we do about people drinking in the parking lots? It's a violation. You can't do it. I hear you loud and clear. We're working on it. Also, uh, don't forget National Night Out, October 3rd. I think somebody asked a question about National Night Out, right? And crisis support code can be reached at 972 227 8790. I just wanted to add uh, regarding Mickey's. Um, she said that they're working on coming up with something more stringent that isn't in, that isn't in place yet. So my cards are out there. Please email me so I can keep you personally updated on the changes they make. Hundreds of videos. Ma'am, uh, we understand. We are legally trying to eradicate that, but we do have to follow the law. So it's more than just writing citations. We're exploring legal options to eradicate, but I'm not, it, these I'm processes, afraid, unfortunately, I'm afraid of being shot uh, through my bedroom window in, in the night. That's what I'm afraid of. Well, I'll tell you what, um, we agree with you and we're doing all that we legally can. It just takes a little longer than we would like, but we'll stay on top of it. Thank you. We'll be happy Thank to visit you. with y'all after the meeting as well. Thank you. you bet. You have another question? Oh. 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 Hi, guys. So, um, talking about the nuisance that they had at the bar, 
and we understand with these short-term uh, rentals that this may become an issue in our neighborhoods. So is the only thing we're going to do is issue citations or can you revoke that permit? You can revoke the permit after so many uh, violations. How many is that? Ted, you might want to come up here while you're walking up here. Kevin, yes, we're actually pursuing, I think, our first revocation up north. Chad, you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I guess, is there is there a criterion? Is there a process? And uh, how does that all fit into the eliminating a, a, a bar, basically, in our neighborhoods? So we don't have a specific number of violations, and we're currently working on the process. Like, so you said there is no number? Correct. But we're working with the attorneys right now on a process. We actually have one short term model that we're working on the revocation process. I guess I'm looking for a little bit more details. I mean, me calling the chief over here, you know, about a house that's breaking our, you know, in our neighborhood. And he comes out and says, hey, turn it down. Here's a citation. And then next week, we've got a new renter and they're doing the same thing. That, I, I just tell you that won't go on our name. Yeah. So, so what you're talking about is short-term rental. And, okay. So, a couple of different things. First and foremost is uh, we are uh, when we have an issue like that, we attack it on several fronts. One, we attack the person that's a renter, which is a short-term issue. That that's to address the problem you're seeing right this very second. We also have an automated system that tracks all short-term rentals in the in the city. So even if we don't get a complaint from you. Our police department is aware if the police department is dispatched to a short-term rental. When we get that, then we determine whether or not they violated the ordinance, whether they parked on the street, too many people there, loud noise, whatever it is. Then we cite the owner. If we get uh, an issue with the ownership, we look at it and you just use a common sense approach. We've got a se several up north that are pain in the neck. On those, we're revoking their uh, ability to do uh, business as a short-term rental. Now they can no longer do it. If they choose to continue to do it, then we tag in the legal beagles to go about leaning their property, running them out of town. Does that answer your question? It sure does, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Next question. I'll get to the job, don't worry. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to know about the traffic. Um, I've seen a big change since I moved to Grand Prairie, and as more people coming in, the traffic's getting worse, and it's almost everyone on the Channel 8 News now is a death fatality on the I-20 almost every day. So I'm just, are we doing anything? The cars are speeding, I mean, chasing each other, racing on the 20. I'm not seeing any police. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me, let me first correct a couple of things. I can promise you we're not having fatalities on I-20 every day. That, that, however, one is too many, right? So uh, we, we did have two recently, and that's why I can understand why it feels that way. Uh, yes, ma'am, we absolutely up there writing uh, citations. Uh, just, and yes, you're right, people are speeding. Our speedy, speeders are increasing, particularly since COVID. We've noticed that speeding has gone up. So we're doing what we call wolf packs where we put our trap motor officers up there. They get up there with the, the lasers over the uh, the, the uh, overpass, thank you, and then radio to the guy down the road and we write a bunch of tickets. Now I'll tell you, anytime we get out there in droves and we write a bunch of tickets, inevitably I hear from my citizens saying, Chief, you and your speed traps, you're out there writing everybody tickets. <laughs> so kind of get it on both ends, right? So uh, yes, ma'am, I'm aware. With our uh, although our traffic fatality numbers are consistent, uh, one is too many, and we're on top of it. And I promise you, uh, you can't drive five minutes without seeing a Grand Prairie police car. So I, I, they're out. I'm gonna stay close. <laughs> My name is John Stewart. I reside at four three one five Hampton Circle here in the city of Grand Prairie. And you know, sometimes things can become just a little negative. And when you pay someone a compliment, it's like you're kissing up to them. Well, I'm kissing up. <laughs> Steve, thank you for your leadership. You and the mayor, I mean that wholeheartedly. Your staff, your staff is impeccable. 
I've never made a call and didn't get a response. They stay on top of things. So as you work through the process, super great. But the only thing that I want to say in addition to that, and Chief, I'm sure you can address this. There are many people that talk about the state of Texas, but we're having a lot of people moving here from other states. And I can name several of them, but they, they, maybe they think that I'm trying to bad mouth them or something. But this is Texas. And we take care of business in Texas. So emergency vehicles, you've worked on them. When we call you on that, you've done a great job. But when emergency vehicles come into our neighborhood and you got cars parked on both sides of the road, you guys have worked on it. So where are we on that? Because if we do need an emergency vehicle, it may present a problem. So I, I think this, first of all, John, thank you for your not kind comments. I, if it were up to me, I'd give you two or three more questions. <laughs> So uh, the, an the answer is uh, that's a, a reoccurring issue. Hello, there it is. That's a reoccurring issue, and we can't blame on people coming from California or anywhere else. I can talk loud enough. Uh, I, I think we can blame just as many Texans as we can Californians on, on the issue. Uh, our code team, that's a, that's a very hot button issue, particularly for our fire uh, chief, because of the fire trucks getting in and out. We, we try our very best to stay on top of that, John, but I would tell everyone, if you see an issue with parking that you feel like will preclude emergency vehicles from getting in, call 911. We'll get out there, we'll site and tow immediately. And then, Mr. Stewart, um, the other thing that we're trying to do is as we're developing new neighborhoods, try not to make those historic mistakes again, maybe a little bit longer driveways, a little bit wider streets to prevent that in the future. Thank you. Any other comments, sir, about how great the stuff is? <laughs> We have a question on Zoom for our transportation department. Is there anything in the works to offer free via rides on election day or during early voting so that people can get out to the polls? Good question. This question is for Marty. Uh, I really do appreciate all the uh, economic development that's going on in Grand Prairie. How about 161, 30, and Beltline? Is there anything that's going to be going on there? Yeah, we're concentrating on uh, really all parts of the city. I would tell you, when, when I first got hired seven years ago, uh, the council and the, and the management team said, let's focus on getting things going on the President George Bush Turnpike. We've shifted in the last year, year and a half to focus on other areas. I think the evidence of getting, for instance, um, the, the new uh, Blue Goose Cantina is, is proof that we're, it's happening in other places. And we think we can continue that momentum on 20. Didn't show you the pictures, but I did talk about cricket. With everything that's going on on I-30, we do have the first project that's about to break ground here uh, as a part of the gateway Grand Prairie that was envisioned by Omni Plan Architects for our council a couple of years ago. OHT, uh, a company out of Houston and Dallas, is going to be starting a, a project, a six and seven story wrap, high quality multifamily there on I-30 at Stadium Drive, right uh, next to, or just a little bit north of Grand Prairie High School. I think that will lead the way for other types of office, hotel, retail, and in, in selective instances, high quality multifamily there. So it's an urban type center on I-30. Uh, we've got, uh, if, you, if you came or listened to the city, the count, the mayor's state of the city, uh, a couple of months back, we talked a little bit about a, a gentleman who's acquired about 130 acres uh, at Riverside and, and 360. And he's planning, he's working to reclaim a good deal of that and is planning for a development as is the property owners that are affiliated with Viridian uh, that own the Riverside Golf Course. And we're working with them on the possibility of putting an elevated frontage road so that the golf course site can be redeveloped potentially with uh, other kinds of quality development and still maintain the golf course. Uh, so I think there's real potential to continue doing things in a number of places. Uh, the, the area on 161, if you were talking about far north maybe, uh, 
that continues to be uh, an area we're focusing on. We think we've got some potential for some high quality residential, perhaps near carrier, uh, where there's land available for something like that, as well as maybe some retail if we can get someone interested. The challenge with retail is nobody wants to be a one and only. They want to be near other types, other stores. So that may be a challenge. But I can I can promise you we're going to continue to focus on as we can all six districts within the city to see how we can bring about the best development possible. I wanted to follow up, uh, Marty, when you mentioned the multifamily near 30 and Beltline. Um, I know we had earlier said we don't want multifamily, but then I just want to highlight some of the metrics that these companies are looking at to decide if they want to come. They want people to be over there. That's right. So sometimes a well-placed multifamily development can then bring the restaurants and the businesses that you want because they don't want to be in the middle of where there are no people. So that's something to think about, not necessarily our issue in District 2, but there are a lot of other parts of Grand Prairie where that is an issue. We need to bring more residential. And, and if I may add, that has zoning. So like y'all talked about earlier, council passed a resolution, by the way, uh, a couple of years ago, and then reiterated it two years ago in July, a policy position on development and economic development, and pretty much used that as something we could then turn around and hand to developers to say, they don't want to change zoning. You know, if you want to do it, you go to something that's already zoned that way. This particular property had zoning, and you make a great point about what it could mean of other kinds of restaurants and retail to come there. I, I might add, related to that site, and we can't really talk about the location yet, but you may have seen an article that came out a couple of months back that uh, there's a couple of restaurants that have been known in North Texas for quite some time that want to come to I-30 in Grand Prairie. They are still moving forward with a developer. So I think we're going to have the chance to bring that kind of development and it's going to be helped by these kinds of projects. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harold Willis. I want to talk about the American Rescue Plan. Not one Texas Republican voted for the American Rescue Plan. I've asked for the city manager. We've received what, April of 21, April of 22. We've not had one public hearing on where this money from the federal government has been spent. I also want to say Grand Prairie is more or less a Democratic city, not a Republican stronghold. So this is, we need to know where is this money going? Where is it now? Well, one of the great things I love about Grand Prairie, we're diverse and I don't think we think R&D. That's just my personal opinion. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act funding, all of those discussions have been at public staff presentations. Uh, there's about 18 million in each tranche. Some of that money has been spent. Uh, there's still quite a bit of money left. Council is considering that very thoughtfully, talking about park improvements, community centers, things that, that can go the furthest that that dollar can go for the, for the public good. Um, they're being very responsible in how they're analyzing and spending that. Uh, Harold, if you'll send me an email, I'll be glad to show you what they've encumbered, what they've spent and what is remaining. A lot of the decisions are still up in the air because we have a lot of projects going on and we do have a little bit of time to spend all that money. But again, public purpose is the main kind of thought process behind spending those dollars. Next question. Yes, I'd like to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to ask a question with regards to mention 7504. Time's up. <laughs> Mirror Library. Um, and my question is about economic development um, with regards to are there any plans outside of the shack uh, and the nail um, and the donut shop? Are there any plans to really develop that as a class A site uh, sitting around the uh, lake? There's a lot of discussion about the lake. Uh, plus, we've had discussions where the recreation center or community center would go. We, Marty and the staff has gone out to try to get white tablecloth restaurants because that's what you guys want. They're not interested in going down there right now. So, and I've made it clear that Burger King, Whataburger, Wendy's are not coming down there. So uh, that if they came, definitely not to worry about it. I'm going to vote no for that. So um there are some discussions i mean i don't want to talk about it right now but there's a lot of discussion amongst the lake around the lake because 
a lot of cities want to have lake property and build around it. And that's something we discussed. How do we build the lake on the north side of the lake? The reason why I say that is because I get 75054 across the bridge, start coming up closer to the city. So there's some discussions with uh, District 4, House uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Chairman Lopez. He shares down Lake Ridge Parkway, west side, I have the, the east side. So uh, we're discussing that with council and some other members about what could we bring down there off the lake. So we are discussing that. It just takes time with the white tablecloths in the lake, the way they normally do their demographics, you know, stick a pencil here and go around. They don't see the numbers. Plus, they're looking for the lunch crowd. There's no lunch crowd down there. So we try to throw in a lot of folks working home, like myself. And I'm always looking. I'm tired of going to Canes in Chick fil A. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, but I go there a lot because it's quick. Yes, sir. He's just going to read the mic. Uh, you were mentioning about the north side of the lake. Are there any, does the city have any input on uh, opening up the dam again? Uh, how it was paid? People were riding their bikes and running and so on and so forth. We, we would love to open it. It's the core decision. We don't have any standing. We relayed to them many times that we'd love to open up. They uh, don't want to spend, it's, it would take a lot of money to repair it to make it safe. And they just are not willing to spend that money, but we've vocalized that on many occasions. Dwayne, anything to add to that? So the current dam road uh, serves its purpose as a service road uh, for, for all the, the, the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, vehicles to access and utilize that uh, with, with the gaps in the road, no issues for vehicles, but for runners and for cyclists, that's where it becomes unsafe. And so it's serving their purpose. So for the core, it, it serves their purpose, but on the, on the public side and more and more and more uh, dams around the, around the state are they're, they're taking that away from the citizens. There's just too much in this, in this day and age, there's just too many ways that, that, the, the wrong people could utilize that. And so Graham, uh, Joe Poole was one of the very few ones that still allowed vehicle access or, or pedestrian access back and forth. And when they when they started getting lawsuits because of cyclists and runners that were getting hurt, that's when they just said, you know, this one's going to be closed uh, and then we'll repair it when it's time. <laughs> and that repair it when it's time, that's been five to eight years ago. It's been a while. And so you know, we, we can continue to ask uh, every time Steve and I meet with with the core. We always talk about that. There there is there is no there's no hair on fire that they're they're interested in, in making that anytime soon uh, as much as we would post. Another question? Yeah, quick question. Um, will we be able to get like a Market Street or Sprouts or help? Press what she's asked as well as tie in with your seven five zero five four note. Number one, uh, yes, we market to a lot of those groups. Part of the challenge is though is we've got them real close by in Mansfield. Yeah. We share, Dallas Business Journal put out an article a year, year and a half ago of the top zip codes in North Texas. 75054 was number 11, the 11th most, most wealthiest zip code in all of North Texas. So that I can promise you, we're taking that data and we're going to the folks, some of the ones you've, met, you've named, and I'm encouraged and we're going to continue to and hold on, we're going to get there. Okay. It might sound the truth because we're trying to find other ways to get around the, the, the way they do the old marketing. We've got to show them some other things to get them interested in coming here. But if not, we know we got one in the back pocket. <laughs> they can read it. <laughs> I heard earlier 
mention the uh, wildlife parkway improvements. Uh, I assume that's the down on the other side of Linear Park. Is, is that right? And what's the scope of that project? Wildlife Parkway is up north, uh, north of I-30. Basically, uh, you take Beltline to where Lone Star Park is and come up to Hunter Farrell. On the east side, the west side is, is a Wildlife Parkway. Right now, it's a two-lane asphalt roadway. You proceed westbound to me, you get to Hard Rock, it kind of curves up. What we're doing is two things. We're going to stand Wildlife Parkway from Beltline all the way to George Bush. Second thing is going to be it's going to be widened uh, two lanes to four lanes by the road. It is a joint project with Dallas County. Project is currently under construction. Probably have about eighteen months left on it. We're about six months in. It's a two-year project. What's the impact to the park where it intersects one sixty-one? It's going to help out a couple of different things. Number one is going to help out our, our, we got a lot of heavy truck traffic in that area trying to get to the industrial district. It's going to help that out. It's going to also uh, uh, give us more access into the entertainment district. Uh, if you are George Bush, give us another access in order to get to, to Lone Star. So it, it, it also helps out the entire grid system because it, it creates more routes for us. Helps out Hard Rock, helps out Shady Grove and the, and the streets to the north also. With that in conjunction, with the frontage roads that test out is working on right now. That's out the entire grid system. Just remember, uh, Walter said in about 18 months it'll be completed. He's gonna come back and say, good news, it's completed. <laughs> Bad news, <laughs> the train is not there. Just joking. It's the wetland. They'll be drinking. Uh, no <laughs> <laughs> Quick question is for the uh, parks department. And so, within regards to uh, Central Park, um, I'm, I'm kind of a nature lover. And a few years back, that area was cleared, cut, uh, missing the opportunity to create some real nice nature trails. And after that happened, I was told that a prairie would be uh, recent, the prairie would be restored. I haven't seen that happen. I was wondering if it's uh, still in the works. And, and when you when you talk about Central Park, Epic Central, is is it where the the epic and, and uh, the epic waters? Pretty much all that grassy area around the, uh, the retention ponds. Yes, yes. I, I was, you know, they had started starting to build some prairies. You know, they put in, they seeded the area. Yes. But now it's mowed all the time. You're never going to have a prairie if you're going to mow all the time. Right. So, <laughs> so, and, and I think we've talked at least online a couple of times that, that the, the question uh, sounds familiar. Uh, so, pretty much everything that is, is developed is now been developed. What's left is 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 what we've thrown around as as epic nature. Uh, it's everything around the, the, the ponds on that side is all in the wetlands or with four four wet uh, the four four area with the with the creeks. So all those will in our next phase for that 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 epic nature area is that will be developed into uh, to you know trails with, with with butterfly gardens and and those those type of uh, natural area. Uh, it's just right now she's not on the on the uh, on, on the the, uh, the the CIP plan, but that area has been set aside for the the nature side. <clears throat> we have maybe five to six minutes left, and we all know in sports, yeah. when it's two minutes, it's thirty minutes. Yeah. Because we know here, five six minutes can be five six minutes. The library will close in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Question. On Zoom. When it says it's for both districts, um, what can the city do about now not allowing 18 wheelers to park in parking lots? Um, for example, the Coles parking lot on Carrier. That's been addressed. Oh. <laughs> that Just when I thought I was going to make it out of five minutes. <laughs> Uh, so the specific question was related to 18 wheelers in the Co Coles parking lot. That's private property. Our code team went out and met with the ownership group and encouraged them to um, enter into a contract with a record service, which they've done and are now uh, as recently as last week, Chad, do I have that right pretty close or this week? Last week started towing all those trucks out of there. 
Um, so if it's private property, we get with the ownership group, we highly encourage them to uh, develop a relationship with the record service to get them out of there. If it's public property, we send our commercial vehicle team out there to see what we can do to get them to move on. Hope that answers the question. Um, when I was at the Texas Municipal League uh, conference, TML conference, they discussed the issue with us being so central in the country and a lot of these 18 wheelers coming through. And there actually is funding for these 18 wheeler like parking lots. They need it. They need it. Now, that has been controversial in some of the other cities who tried to bring that. Some people didn't want that near them. Uh, but I think we're seeing that it is an issue in Grand Prairie. Um, I don't believe we have plans for that just yet, but uh, there's funding for it. That's our procedure. Yeah, we do have a few of the parking lots. So one of the reasons we're kind of hard on parking in this parking lots, there are parking lots available. The other thing I'm proud of a few years ago, we posted no parking signs up and down 360 service roads. When you see those trucks on the 360 service roads, those are Mansfield or Arlington. We allow none of them in Grand Prairie. We're the only one of the three cities that does that because we think it's a safety issue and an eyesore. So if you see new areas where you're seeing trucks parked, that in our city, please email me or the chief and we'll jump on it. Thank you. Okay, I think we're gonna close unless, was there another, oh, there's another question. <laughs> Hi, how's everyone doing? I have a question for city management. Because this is a legislative year and there are a lot of house bills and Senate bills that are being passed, do you know which ones mm -hmm. are gonna impact Grand Prairie or how it's going to impact our property values, school vouchers, all of that good stuff that we're listening for. That's so can you tell me who? Come, 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 come. Yeah. 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 Get with him after me, but real quickly, there's a lot of bills filed. We're watching all of them. Gerald gives regular updates. Uh, Gerald, just a real quick recap, and then give it Gerald after the meeting. He'll be glad to visit. Absolutely. Quick recap, as you all know, the local local control has been under fire. 2127. Uh, that's the big issue. More to the quality of life, we have HB 1750, which now they're allowing people to do agricultural work in city limits so let your uh, HOAs know about that and then they have what's 23 40 I can't think of the number but they, the, they're trying to allow people to rent their swimming pools and a lot of people in legislation believe that's a toehold for the SDRs so we're watching a lot of that closely if you want more details uh, come see me afterwards but the main thing is local control preemption and we have to think of it as cities are the state's conscience and private entities are their contributors. And so we'll continue to advocate for it. And, and Gerald is our legislative affairs. He's in Austin every week. So we're actively involved representing our city down in Austin. And anything on the casinos that you can share with us? Oh, yeah. oh, did, did you raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of talk about the casinos. It's looking good, but there are actually a lot of critics are saying that it may not happen this session. But maybe next session. And uh, matter of fact, Lieutenant <laughs> Governor Patrick said that the majority of his party doesn't vote for it, he's not going to support it. But it's looking very positive. A lot of the sports industries are looking at it, supporting it. So there's a lot of money. It's, maybe not this session, but the next session is looking very positive. Thank you. Just one second. That's what Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're working very hard for you all in District 2 and District 6, as well as for the uh, city at large. Um, we are very excited to give you updates. We are active even at the capital level in Austin, as well as Washington, D.C. So Grand Prairie, uh, our city name is being heard far and wide. We're getting a lot of attention and we're going to keep making Grand Prairie epic. Yeah, right. Uh, if you want to contact us, go to gptx.org and send us an email. That's that way. Uh, uh, that's where I like to operate because it's in writing and gives a written response back. So thank you for coming out and look forward to seeing you uh, at the next town hall. Thank you. Thank you.